Hi, and welcome to another day of Solaris's Summer of Love. I am your host, MC Solaris, paranormal romance author of the Orion's Order series. And, oh, I see Steven. Hello, Steven. Okay, I'm going to invite you to join. Okay, I think I sent it. Hey, Vanda. Nice to see you. I wonder what time it is for you. Okay, Steven, I sent you the invite. Um, and a reminder, I believe you have to be on your phone. So I'm not sure <laughs> if you're on your laptop. You might need okay. Hey, Steven. Hi. How you doing, Marina? <laughs> I'm good. Hello, author. <laughs> famous author. <laughs> How are um, you? I'm speaking to the famous author. That's you. <laughs> um. Okay, yeah, I can see you. I can see me. I think we're all set. This is the first time I've done this on Instagram, so it's been interesting. You know, it seems like it's working out. It looks like we got a few people joining us. I keep seeing names, you know, yeah. here. Okay, I great. So, so, hey, I think, and it says that we're live and we're recording. And hey, hey, Vanda. Hey, Sheldon. Hi, Amber Lee. Hi, Heart Rock Healing. Wait, is that Phaedra? Hey, Phaedra. <laughs> Or wait, no, that is, um, I'm sorry, the names are scrolling by fast. But anyways, hello, hello, hello. Um, okay, so I think we just get started. What do you think, Stephen? And I know the comments are there, but in the recording, don't worry, they will not show or block your face um, afterward. So. All right. Well, good. I, thank you for inviting me. I, this is a new experience. You know, it's always good to have new experiences. So uh i'm on i'm ready to roll uh let me see i want to make sure the lights are there we go okay oh, right Stephen. <laughs> okay so um hello and welcome to another day of solaris's summer of love i am your host mc solaris paranormal romance author of the orion's order series and today I'm so excited to not only talk all about love, but also introduce you to a very, very special guest. This is someone whose work and teachings not only changed my life, but inspired many of the elements that are woven into the stories that I write. And this is someone who I had a great opportunity to learn from and someone who I considered a mentor, a guide, and a spiritual teacher, and someone who I hold a very special place in my heart. So without further ado, please meet Dr. Stephen Farmer. Dr. Stephen Farmer is a licensed psychotherapist, soul healer, and author of several best-selling books and oracle cards, including Animal Spirit Guides, Earth Magic, Children's Spirit Animal Cards, Healing Ancestral Karma, and the recently released Shaman's Path Cards. Dr. Farmer holds individual consultation and relationship counseling in person or remotely by phone or Zoom. Drawing from his wealth of training and experience as a psychotherapist, shamanic healer, and trauma recovery specialist. He offers a popular and individualized spiritual mentorship and life coaching program and serves on the board of the Society of Shamanic practice. Today, Stephen is going to be offering us a gift for healing with ancestors. So, hey, Stephen. <laughs> I, and, I to say, I'm so proud of you. Like, you've just taken a run with it, you know, and to write a, to write a novel, you know, that's, uh, that's one of my distant dreams is I'd love to write a novel. And, you know, who knows, maybe I will at some point. But I, I admire you for doing that, you know, and, and respect you a great deal for carrying that forward. So, and I see the audio version is available. So I, I think I might, I might pick that one up and plug it in. And uh, I'm just finishing with the story now in the car. And I've got a, <laughs> so that'll be nice. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for having me on, on this uh, show. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the audiobook is done. I'm actually proofing the second audiobook, and we're about to start recording the third one um, wow. soon. So, yay! But speaking of books, um, I have some of your books with me. So, oh there's some that I mentioned Earth Magic, Your Sacred Ceremony, 
and also your oracle cards oh whoops sorry upside down so um yeah like i was saying a lot of the things that i i learned from you and all the experience in doing the mentorship program and i think at the time it was called the the earth magic but um a lot of the teachings and i refer back to you your books and these are the ones that i have physical copies of but i have your audio book of healing ancestral karma and i have also some of your other ones on um, like your animal spirit guides, I love to have them in ebook form. So that way I can go and like check when I'm on a walk or something, you know, <laughs> and I see some uh, thank Yeah, um, thank you, Marina. And yes, I've got, uh, it's, it's so interesting. I don't know how this happened, but I've got about, uh, I think four other um, products uh, that will be coming out over this next several months. And one of those is pertinent, uh, relevant to uh, the, discussion or the presentation at least on ancestors uh it's an oracle card deck yet another oracle card deck you know the world needs another oracle card deck <laughs> anyway it's a uh, um really happy with this a really different take on ancestors it's called messages from your ancestors and the uh, creation of it was just very interesting i had a lot of help you know and guess from who the ancestors you know in so many different ways and uh, just a comment on that is constructed, um, all Oracle cards are constructed maybe in slightly different ways. <clears throat> and the one that, the method that I like that works into the messages from your ancestors is a little piece on one of the guide, it, they all come with guidebooks typically. And you open, you read the card, there's maybe a message on the card or a word, certainly an image. And then you go to the guidebook to read the more extensive reading uh, although you can get a reading just from contemplating the image and the statement on the card, uh, is to put some information on one page of the guidebook and the other I call it a download, meaning um, sitting in a contemplative state uh, and asking, actually thanking, most of my prayers are thank yous, but thanking the ancestor, the particular ancestor to what do I need to write here? And it's pretty amazing. The process is, um, I think you can probably relate, is I put my fingers on the keyboard and my hands start writing, you know, and, and I look at it and I go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. You know, I, I was sort of there, you know, half my usual self was there. Anyway, the, the, the ancestors have called to me uh, to uh, support the awareness of their our connection to the ancestors. We often think of, let's say, people who have passed, who've gone on like mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, as deceased loved ones, which is fine. It's not instead of that. But also, I want people to start considering those who have come before as ancestors. Not only that, but if you go back far enough, you know, and think about this, this is pretty heavy or pretty light, one of the two, that if you think about generations back, you know, first off, um, we have something like, uh, in after 20 generations, we have like a million ancestors, you know, a little bit more. So, you know, it, and it continues to multiply from there. I think it's called geometrically. I'm not sure if that's the correct word, but two equals four equals eight equals 16, et cetera, on down the line. But if you think of the history of our species, humans, you know, there were some other uh, beings here uh, before we got here. How it happened, you can read it somewhere, you know, you can read theories about it, science about it, etc. But how did it get to be that primates arrived here on Earth and that we evolved from primates? One of them was born, got up on two legs instead of four, <laughs> And the rest is history. But prior to that, what happened? The first beings on this planet were the plant people, and typically under the ocean. So my premise for uh, the cards in particular, but also a way to think about ancestors, it goes way, way back. Uh, the Hawaiians, the, the old religion of the Hawaiians, I'm told, and I think it's true, say that the first ancestor, the earliest ancestor, was a plant, mm -hmm. the taro plant, which is a very popular plant, and it's used for poi. You know, it's a very popular uh, food that's um, 
made from the taro plant. Anyway, the point being is it goes way, way back. And then if you want to stretch your imagination even more, think about how did, how did life itself get started, you know, on this amazing planet. I was looking at the planet Venus, which in, I'm not sure about the Southern Hemisphere, but the Northern Hemisphere, it's out to, in the evening. It's the evening star during this season, summer and, and on into uh, fall for a period of time, and then it flips over and becomes the morning star. But I was looking at it, I went, I just had this moment of a revelation and a deep, uh, I don't know what I'd call it, awe, A-W-E. I looked, I went, wow, that's a planet. Yeah, I know that intellectually, but to get, to get it in a deeper way, that's a planet. And we're on this big round rock. <laughs> it's got a lot of water too, but it's a big round rock. How did it get here? And I don't know there's this distinct answer to that. But also that um, the information, a lot of what I call downloads, may, they, they come through shamanic journeys, they come through contemplation, uh, they come every morning, I sit down and uh, I do some writing in my uh, computer, uh, online, uh, would that be right? No, the computer, I have a journal I keep and every morning I sit down and I'll write about this and that. Then I go into an altered state. I would call it just a mild altered state and I write down, okay, what's going on? So there's different ways that um, those of you listening, I'm sure you have different ways to access that spiritual information. Uh, again, what I call downloads from you know, whatever invisible spirit being, you know, you happen to work with. And what came up, Marina, was very interesting. DNA, <clears throat> the original ancestor, the master ancestor. Now, scientifically, there's probably scientists that would go, that's posh. But to understand who we are, I think it helps to dip into the soul's reality, <clears throat> you know, as well as ordinary reality, you know, where, oh, I got to go down to the supermarket and get some food, and et cetera. But the soul's reality speaks to a different part of us. I don't have, I don't pretend that it's true or not. But it was based initially on a story in uh, Michael Harner's book, Way of the Shaman, where he was uh, way back before ayahuasca became, a, you know, somewhat of a new age household name, whether you've in, ingested or not. He was down in the Amazon basin in, in the late 50s, early 60s. And with the guidance of a shaman, <clears throat> did that brew, that plant medicine and had some visions. And one of those was these beings that came across from some planet and they were being chased by their enemies and some of them landed here on this globe when it, in its early formation. That story has always stuck with me. And so I just elaborated on that, that they landed in the ocean. Uh, they started forming, uh, uh, they were individuals, but then they started forming collectives. And the collectives became not only more complex, but they, they were uh, uh, designed to adapt to the circumstances of the planet at the time. Now, you don't have to believe it. You don't have to disbelieve it. You know, just open again. That's the soul's reality. Uh, it has nothing to do with what we consider usually to be truth. You know, it's a soul's truth. You think about it and you go, huh, it makes a certain amount of sense. Yes. So I did something in that way, very unusual with these cards, starting with that was the master ancestor. And there's archetypal ancestors, which means, let's say, Ernest Hemingway. I uh, actually called on him the other day. Uh, with a piece I was writing and uh, it felt like he came through, you know, that, that sort of thing that we can connect with those who have come before. So that's uh, back up a little, little further, a few uh, billion years actually, to uh, ones that we can more uh, understand and connect with. And those would be the ancestors in our human lineage. And again, it could be grandma, grandpa. Some people, they talk about having a guide that is a great grandfather or great grandmother, and that's fine. And there is also another category that we call the elders. And here's the deal on the elder ancestors and those that, that were once embodied and walked around, you know, here on this land, on this planet. And then um, I guess you'd say ascended, you know, into the, I don't like that word to describe this, at least I don't like it. But after they died, you know, they went to the afterlife, they went through and people when they go to the afterlife, when you die, you still have some lessons, you still have some things to do. And um, the good news for everybody listening is that when you heal, when you do any healing work, 
as a, a dear friend of mine, a medium psychic says, it goes forward and backward. That our, our descendants, of course, are affected with our healing work, but also those who have come before, particularly in the more recent generations that are doing the work in the afterlife to keep clearing, clearing, clearing as they move through these um, stages of the afterlife. Um, and we can support them simply by doing our own healing. And then again, um, well, it looked like smoke there that went up. Anyway, the, <laughs> the wolf, <laughs> not what that was. Yeah, I mean, they're little hearts. People are liking what you're saying, so. <laughs> oh. So anyway, that's the good news, you know, is we can help our ancestors, you know, in that way. And, and it's very simple. You just do your own work. But I also think that um, it's important right now, it's really important to start making those connections to those in the afterlife. And again, we're not talking about going back to DNA necessarily or, or a, a particular uh, ancestor or an archetypal ancestor. We're talking about, you know, grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, you know, great, great grandma, etc. maybe three, four generations back to where we can connect with them in some way and honor their presence in our lives. We're a very, the, the broader Western culture is very unusual in that way. You know, there's so many cultures, both contemporary as well as indigenous that really have a place for the ancestors. And this is kind of new stuff for us. You know, I'm seeing it more and more, which I'm happy to see, but this is, this is a, a, a new sort of a way of, perceiving and operating spiritually and, and shamanically is to be able to connect with the ancestors. Like, um, if I may say one more piece, then I'm going to shut up and see if there's any uh, questions or anything. I, I've been given a, a very simple uh, sacred ritual every morning, and I'm doing pretty well. For about 30 days, I'm, I was told I had, not I had to, but to perform this, you know, by my ancestors. I have a collective that Sometimes I call it, I call the collective the teacher. And that's the one I usually put, okay, teacher, you're, you're on, you know, and then I get the downloads. But it was a simple water ritual, which is the first thing in the morning before coffee, before even bleary eyed, you know, if I get up bleary eyed or whatever, is to take a glass of water and all with appreciation of water and to go out to the land, which the land for me is the backyard and I raise the cup up to the high place, the celestial, and I thank the ancestors. I thank the ancestors for their gifts, the gifts of inspiration, the gifts of guidance, and to, uh, that this water, this lifeblood is be imbued, you know, with that inspiration, that guidance, their blessings, and their love. And then the next thing I was assigned to do is to just go around 360 in a circle and thank all of the relatives, meaning all the beings on this planet, you know, for their blessing and for their guidance, you know, thank you for their sustenance, you know, the, et cetera. Um, and then I thank Earth Mother, Pachamama. I thank her for the blessing of being able to walk on her body. I thank her for the sustenance that, that keeps us alive and keeps us going. And then I pour a little water as an expression of that gratitude onto the land. And then I take a sip, I, a sip, I drink the rest of the water. That's, see how simple that is? And you guys, it's not patented, there's no copyright. So please feel free, feel free to use it. You know, it's a way to connect with the ancestors too. Yes, some people um, may think more about archangels in the celestial or the, the uh, in shamanic uh, languages, the upper world or the celestial or the high place, you know, is another way to put it. And that's fine too. Uh, I encourage you in addition to that, if uh, archangels, you work with Michael or any of the archangels also to incorporate the work with the ancestors and they can help us heal too, interestingly enough. So anyway, that's my pitch for ancestors. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to you um, pretty much all day. And it, it really reminds me of the times when we we did gather and I did have an opportunity to just 
sit, I mean, we talk about ancestors and I mean, leaving living ancestors or soul ancestors. And when I sit and I listen to you or even right now, I get the feeling of like, I'm listening to my ancestor and like, I'm getting teary eyed because I just, I love what you say so much and I resonate with you. And it's, um, it's just, it's so beautiful. I think someone said that. Yeah. Courtney said that's so beautiful and it's, <clears throat> yeah, so insightful. Awesome. It really is. And I love that. And I can't wait <laughs> until we can um, see those cards and have access to the wisdom and the, the the teachings that you're able to give us and share with us. It's oh, yeah, okay. see, all the, the heart smoke, right? <laughs> the heart smoke. I love that. I love that, okay. <laughs> I love that you were talking about, um, or, you know, but no, <laughs> it's on Instagram. Anyway, go ahead, Maria, I interrupted. No, I was gonna say, I love that you were talking, that you thought it was smoke because um, one of the things when I was sitting with you and I was learning from you was um, we talked about tobacco smoke and how uh, the healing, I'm sure you could speak to this, but how the smoke rises and you're, you're touching into the celestial and it was like a blessing. So I love that you said smoke because that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, yeah. Tobacco is interesting because it's it's in a very real sense been demonized. You know those nasty cigarettes. You know because we associate tobacco with cigarettes. You know naturally, and uh, you know from what I've read and heard, of course, that most of uh, most tobacco, excuse me, most cigarettes have some toxic uh, ingredients in the paper and perhaps even in the tobacco. The only exception is American spirits. So if you're addicted to cigarettes, smoke American cigarette, or if you I know a couple of people um, that can smoke two or three a day and I envy them because uh, I'm a former smoker many, many years haven't smoked and I can't, you know, cause I, I, I quit one time and then 10 years later I thought, well, I'll just try one. And then I was hooked again and then I quit again <laughs> and it was very difficult and I'm glad I did, but sacred tobacco is a little different. And um, it up the topic of reciprocity a great word, it's a new word for for today that we, I think we have to start enacting this idea, you know, bringing it into um, our, actually our daily lives, that we, we receive so much, you know, from the ancestors, from the high place, from the and what tobacco can be is an offering for instance, um, I know there's a, there's a hill or a few hills not too nearby where I keep getting the prompt to go and gather, harvest some sage. You know, just sage all over these hills. It's a great little spot. Now, typically, I think what we would do is to go and go, okay, oh, let's go get some sage, you know, and start, you know, shuffling some of the plant and the, the, the uh, leaves, etc. Well, yeah, you could do that, you know, but uh, I want to go, uh, when I go, I will take some tobacco with me, um, what I consider to be sacred tobacco. And you can also, by the way, use sage or you could use cornmeal as an offering uh, to uh, present to the sage plants and also ask the plants for their blessing that I can receive the uh, their bounty. And um, it, you can hear that in that reciprocity, the exchange. My garden, which I point to the front yard here because uh, there's not a lot of sun in the backyard, uh, that's other piece is what the plants that are growing now give so much to us, you know, in a very small way, but they still give so much to us that it's my duty to make an offering to these plants as a gesture of thanks and to honor that reciprocity. I give something and then I receive something back. I give something and I receive something back. Not with... Um, that I'm doing it just to get something back. You know, I'm really doing it to honor, you know, that which is uh, being presented as available to me in, in a, again, an expression of gratitude too, in a physical expression through tobacco, sage, cornmeal, possibly cedar, you know, things like that. That's, that's, it really is about in a larger sense, treating and bringing the sacred into our day-to-day -day lives. So, there's different ways to do that. The people that are like watching this, I'm sure, have their own ideas or ways or actions that they, they take to 
um, help us remain as much as possible aligned with God or Great Spirit or Source, as Abraham talks about Source. There's a phrase, Marina, that um, has come up quite a bit lately in terms of how do I make, how do I make my choices? And one, the phrase I think comes from the Bible, I'm pretty sure. And it is, I will to will thy will. That then puts the ego in its proper place. I don't buy this stuff about, you know, demolishing the ego. That's baloney. That's not what it's about. The ego, the personality, you could say, or the usual self, uh, that has a place. But where its place has been traditionally, and particularly in our Western culture, but other, way, other areas too, has been trying to grasp, kind of like the alpha male, trying to grab, you know, the front end of the sled, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, instead of like being on the back end and allowing great spirit to be the, uh, the ultimate master, if you will. So I will to will thy will. I'm going to repeat that again. If you guys are listening, write that down somewhere and use it as a mantra. You know, every morning, that could be a simple ceremony you could do is just to repeat that a few times and breathe and to feel that alignment with God, with great spirit. Um, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here, but it, it, I think it's, a, it, I'm going to trust that it's an important um, uh, piece to bring up is to, uh, and also, I'm, I might add to that, yeah, we're forgetful. We're human beings. We're fallible human beings. I was reminded of that the, just the other morning in, a, in, a, in a, one of the downloads in the morning. Almost like a forgiveness to recognize I'm a fallible human being. You know, I have what might be considered flaws, misgivings, doubts, you know, etc. Uh, old stuff, you know, lose my... I don't like it, but, you know, I get angry. I mean, more than I want. I don't mind getting angry, but I get more angry than I want to be. And I just, just be annoyed or pissed off, you know, don't be like, ah, I've got a one-year-old puppy that uh, is a really good trigger for me. <laughs> he's still a puppy and he's lovable and he's sweet, uh, but he barks a lot and I get annoyed with him. I've toned down a little bit. I found a way to manage the barking. But, you know, I react. That's, it's like built in, it's wired into the system. Post-traumatic uh, residuals. I don't, I, I don't like the word uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Like that's a disorder. No, it's a, an incredible order, an incredible way of organizing around trauma, the adaptive capacity of the, of the instinct. But then these triggers keep happening, you know, for instance, and I go, God, how did, how did that happen? How did I get so upset? And you may discover through your work, oh, it's in your body. You know, there's something beyond even the conscious awareness is there's some energy in your body from those earlier traumas. That's a whole nother hour, you know, to, or, or more to talk about that. Anyway, so to get back to this, the ancestors, yeah, I really encourage everybody to give this a try. You know, start working with the ancestors. Call on a grandfather. I don't mean grandpa. I mean a grandfather implying the, the, the elder status or a grandmother, the elder status. Remember we did this one exercise? I don't know if you remember in the, in the class. Pretty sure we did it. But basically, I'm going to just run through it in like 30 seconds. Um, you get in a, a, what I call meditative state. And you ask um, and think a grand, if you're a man, a grandfather, or if you're a woman, a grandmother, and it could be either way, but, you know, go with the gender, you know, a grandfather to come in. And you can feel his hands on your shoulders of support and love and compassion and care, because he's done his homework in the afterlife. And then you ask all of the other grandfathers that are willing to come forward to come forward, so that you now have a line of the grandfathers putting their hands on each other's shoulders. And then you breathe in the power that's generated by that. Anyway, that's a quick recap of the exercise, but it needs to be done more slowly and, you know, just with care and certainly with respect and, and appreciation. 
Okay. I love that. And I love um, just to touch back on what you've just said so much. I'm like trying to remember what to even <laughs> touch on. But like you said, we're forgetful and we're human. But um, so one of the things that you talked about was our plant plants being like our first ancestors in a way. And I, I love that. And even when you were talking about that um, grandfather or ancestor on the shoulder, just quick ceremony, it, you know, eventually in my mind, I was like, well, eventually it's going to be like a tree branch or like a plant that's going to reach out and, and be there. <laughs> that's why the magic of that story, and again, it's a story about DNA is there there is a consciousness with dna even if you break it down into the this identifying the molecule etc is that this idea that they formed collectives that were adaptive to the circumstances of the planet you know when they first arrived it was the ocean because it was too friggin' hot <laughs> you know on the land and then eventually the collective began to assume other characteristics or other characteristics multitudes that were adaptive to the circumstances of the environment. And somewhere along the way, that little being crawled out of the ocean, you know, when the land was cooled down, that was then adaptive to the land, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it, it, I think you're, it's a good, uh, good take on it is, yeah, if you go back far enough, you know, you're related, well, you don't even have to go back far enough. I'm looking out here at the tree and within that tree that there's a life force that is totally related to me, to us. And there's a spirit, not just a life force in that tree, but a connection with all other trees that we could call the spirit, tree spirit. Same thing with animals. You see that fox, you know, walk across your path as you're walking in the woods. Um, that fox may be sent to you in a way to give you a message of some sort. That's the book, you know, you mentioned a couple of books, Animal Spirit Guides, is spirit wants to help us out as humans. Mm -hmm. And our job is to be, get better and better at listening. Absolutely. I just, and uh, yeah, I just, I feel like I just keep going like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, keep going. <laughs> but sure. uh, if yeah. anyone has any comments or questions uh, for Stephen, feel free to, to pop them in. Um, we're happy to, to talk about them too. I know we have quite a few folks that are here enjoying your teachings. And even after the recording, um, try and funnel some questions over. <laughs> That's okay, Stephen. Oh, um, yeah. And I just wanted to talk about the touch on your writing process since a lot of um, my followers are here for uh, well, not here for, but I mean, they follow me because of my books and <laughs> writing and author and stuff. So you talked about how your, your writing process, and it was interesting to see the parallels with how I write too. It's like, even though we're write, I'm writing fiction, I'm still, like I said, I still teach and, and I'm teaching through fictional stories. And it, it was very interesting to hear like your process as far as basically <laughs> sit down and you get into like this meditative or whatever kind of space you want to call it and you you wait for the messages to come for you and you put your you said you put your fingers on the keyboard and then you start typing and it's very similar to me and I feel like that was facilitated by a lot of the stuff that I learned from you it was to just kind of like sit back and and let it come through you and let the stories and the teachings and the lessons flow through you and I know a lot of the the ways that I learned from you was by storytelling you you told stories and that's <laughs> you know yeah yeah i'm i am definitely a storyteller uh, and uh the way i described you know was a particular uh way of writing that is uh, in a in a very real sense a meditative process um, I think number one, <laughs> I have like about seven aphorisms, you know, that I think of when I think about writing uh, and, and writing something like the cards or a book, let's say I'll, I'll leave it at nonfiction at this point, And it's probably true with fiction as well. Creative fiction. Um, the, there's a, there's a balance between structure and process. 
you know, for instance, um, Animal Spirit Guides, the, the book, uh, there was a lot of research that went into that. And then that was probably more about structure with maybe, sure, I don't know, 60, 70% structure and the other 30% would be uh, inspiration, you know, from the spirit animals. Things like the cards, when I get, let's say, uh, I don't know why coyote, you know, comes to mind. I think that's in the power animals, uh, oracle cards. Um, again, it's about, uh, I would read something about coyotes, try to understand it, you know, from the intellectual side. And then when it came to the message from coyote spirit, then it would be, okay, coyote spirit, what do you want me to write? And then, blah, 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 you know, there it would come. Great. Okay. I'd look at it and go, I was kind of listening in on that, but <laughs> you know, there was more to it than that, you know, which I'm sure you've experienced. So I'm going to give uh, everybody who's listening just a few, what are my favorite aphorisms. So bear with me. Okay. One, a friend, Lisa McCord, who's a writer and has done, um, what do you call it? Ghost writing, et cetera, has done her own books. I called her one time when I was stuck on a particular thing and she had the greatest wisdom to offer me. I'd say, Lisa, you know, these cards I'm working on, and she goes, Stephen, just right. Well, yeah, but Lisa, you know, then blah, 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 blah. Stephen, just right. <laughs> uh, another uh, dear friend of mine coached me in my very first book, which is now like, almost 30 years old. I've reissued it as a 25 year anniversary, Adult Children of Abusive Parents. Um, he coached me and he would say things like, Stephen, go for the B. Don't go for the A plus, go for the B. You know, because I would massage like a, a two sentences, I would massage them again and again. And again, go back to Lisa, just write. Um, don't fall in love with your writing. <laughs> and one way to learn that lesson is turn it over to an editor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get really flowery you know and poetic with my writing and I think my god that's a really good piece and it doesn't fit <laughs> it doesn't work yeah you know you got this amazing novel that you've done you've been through it. in fact I, it's right over here I see it it's the Calypso's heart um, so those are a few things I the other thing I think is important to recognize is distractions I mentor as you mentioned that's one of the things i getting a fair amount of clients to mentor and, and some of them are wanting to write and produce something. Uh, children's books, a couple of people want to do children's books, etc. And so, you know, I, 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 my job in part is to give them the hard truths, you know, doing this and what the publishing is like, etc. And that's okay. And we work with it. You know, it's still possible. You can get published so, so much easier today, you know, than it has been in the past. You don't need to go with a big publishing house. You know, anybody in New Age wants to go to Hay House. Yeah, well, great. Get an agent. You know, that might work. Um, <laughs> and so the process of writing, back to your question, Marina. Um, the last thing I would say about that is distractions. Mm -hmm. Writing is a lot about saying no. <laughs> yeah, I got to go work out. Yeah, but you're almost, not, you know, you're on a deadline. Yeah, but I got to work out. You know, I've got to go home oh, the grocery store. We're out of uh, pistachios, you know. So you know, I, 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 am, I have so many potential distractions. But uh, because of my experience, mainly, it's like I, I've learned to, you know, eliminate those as much as possible. I'll give you an example. Oh, yeah, that's another product that's coming out probably in the spring, I think. It's another Oracle card deck. You know, it's called uh, Messages from, your, uh, from the Nature. It's the Spirits of Nature really cool it's going to be really cool that one in fact is with hay house which uh i'm pleased they contacted me you got anything and this is what came up um but uh again i i'm not sure why i brought that up maybe it was a shameless plug i'm not sure <laughs> plug away. Never know, you know. but distractions that's what i was talking wait can you still hear me Steven, I can't hear you. Can, if anyone can put in the comments, can you hear Steven?
Can you guys hear Steven? Can you hear me, Steven? Just me, okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brooke and Marilyn um, and some other ones. Okay, so Steven, now we can see your, your desktop. <laughs> can hear you, but not Steven, okay. Mercury <laughs> retrograde shadow time, yes, bro. Oh, hey, Brooke. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. We're almost out of it, right? Um, I can't remember. S Steven, you know that we, we can see your desktop, but not you now, right? <laughs> we can go off the live and restart if that helps. It looks like he's talking, like I can see his reflection, but, oh, he left, okay. Let me, let me invite him again. Steven. Well, thanks everyone for <laughs> bearing with us during what, it, yeah, what Brooke said, Mercury retrograde shadow time. <laughs> it just cut off like randomly, right? Sometimes it's, it's like that. It needed the other day. Oh, okay. Here. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, you know, uh, forgive me, guys. It's new to me. And now he's frozen. <laughs> you can hear me, though. Okay, I can hear you. Sorry, just froze for a second. I think we're good. All right, good. Uh, my so fault. Just... I should have disabled the calls. Anyway, um, I, now I lost track because it... Uh, that's... Track Anyway, just uh, I think they'll just complete that, you know, that just right. That's probably the best advice, those two words that I tried an experiment in, uh, the other day about I was prompted to do this. And I, it's, I got off the computer. I wasn't on the computer, but I took just a, a, a notepad. And I thought, I'm just going to write stream of consciousness. And so I wrote two pages. Just I didn't ha I had no sensor. I had no filter. And just wrote, it was like, it was an interesting feeling and experience to do that because it didn't matter what I wrote. I wasn't, there's no objective other than to stay just in that stream of consciousness, let the words flow. And when I read it out loud, I, I was amazed. And is it something to publish? Probably not. That's not the point. It reminded me, I read it in a way, it was very dramatic how I ended up reading it you know, just going down the, the phrases, almost like poetry. In fact, if I might post it as a poem of some sort, I don't know yet. I don't know what to do with it, you know, <laughs> maybe nothing. But I, I would suggest, um, hi, Brooke. <laughs> I see Brooke's here. Uh, I would suggest if you have any interest in writing to do that exercise, just take, put it on the clock if you want to, five minutes, whatever or just number of pages, or, or don't even think about that, you know, because then again, you're structuring it. But completely unstructured stream of consciousness. Uh, Julia Cameron wrote something like that in The Artist's Way. She suggested every morning do three pages. She called them morning pages. She said, don't think about it. Maybe that's where I got this. I don't know. Her name has come up recently. So maybe that was, I was inspired by her. Great book, by the way, The Artist's Way. And um, she said, you just write three pages, you know, whatever you write about. You can even write and say, it's a little more structured, but you say, I don't feel like writing today, but I'm going to go ahead and do this exercise, you know, and I think it really sucks that I'm having to do this exercise and I'm making myself do it. You can write whatever you want. And what she um, proposes is that loosens up the creative flow. And I must say, just even doing a, a modification of that, doing a stream of consciousness, really loosened up the uh, creative flow. I'm going to do a, here's a plug for a friend, and I think a really good book. I'm just going to show this if that's okay. It's yeah. called 
The Creative Cure by my dear friend and brother Jacob Nordby. And not just because he's a friend, but this is the where he works, The Creative Cure. And I'm just getting into it, so I, I can't tell you exactly all that's in here, but you might check it out, you know. And uh, Jake, Jacob will send me some money for everybody who signs up. Just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I just, I've been reading it. So it's right here on my desk and it occurred to me, this is what we're talking about, the creativity and all of the, oh, the, the pressures, you know, that we've accumulated about, let's say writing, uh, to really start thinking of yourself as an artist. Isn't that interesting? You're an artist, Marina. You know, as an artist, uh, I work with words. That's my. Absolutely. Like one of the, I have, okay. So, so much, so much I want to say here. So the, the just right. When I first started writing, oh wait, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I thought the screen froze, but you were just very still for a second. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So yeah, when I started writing this, it, it, I didn't sit down and be like, I'm gonna write a fiction romance novel. It was just, it. the story just came and it was one of those things where it's like, oh, I have to write this down because I literally can't do anything else until I write this down, you know? And yeah. so when I actually, that was just like a little bit of world building and getting to know the characters when that came through. But when I first started writing this story, I remember I opened up a blank Google doc page I put chapter one and then I just sat there and it was very like, you know, when you're um, just open to receive, it was just very open to receive and whatever came, that's exactly like exactly as you guys, well, if you ever read my books, exactly as it's written is exactly as I saw it. I just feel like a, a translator, like a scribe and like I'm just kind of sharing the, the lessons and you talk about stream of consciousness and that's exactly how my writing process is and when I spoke to well, with my editor, you kind of talked about editing a little bit. And it was interesting, recently I had a conversation with her and she was like, I really feel like we could do X, Y, and Z here. And I was like, okay, but if I don't see it, it's not, I can't write it, <laughs> you know, because I only write what, what I see and what comes through. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. You know, two words um, come to mind, inspiration. And the word itself means breathe spirit in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a cool way to think about that term. The other is ambition versus calling. Uh, there are some writers who are doing it as an ambition, you know, which is fine. You know, I, who's to judge, you know, what I'm saying here. Yeah. Um, I like getting paid, you know, for what I write. I guess, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I don't think it would bring home the bacon. Yeah. You know, if you're omnivores or the, the uh, fake bacon, whatever. Um, the other, though, is to think about it in terms of a calling. Yeah. You know, like spirit is like tugging you forward. And the choice that you have when you hear, feel, sense that calling is to whether to honor it and act on it or not. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I can do that, you know, and all this stuff comes up, you know, that you were shamed, you weren't allowed, and gosh, who am I to write something like that? You know, all this stuff can come out. Well, you just purge that stuff. Yeah. You, know, you just purge it, clear it out of the way, just like you clean off your desk or something like that. And just write, you know, back, back here we are again. <laughs> anyway, so um, I've enjoyed talking with you about this, and I trust that uh, all the people that are listening on, um, on uh, Instagram uh, have enjoyed this. And uh, I think I can hang around. I have to check the schedule. I know I have uh, appointments coming up, but I don't, I think I've got a few minutes to take uh, questions afterwards. So if you want to do that. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to pop them in and we will, I will facilitate them. And I know someone asked, can they get your books in the UK? I believe the answer is yes. Yeah, you, I think you can get all of them. There's uh, the Hay House UK. Go to that website, Hay House UK, and you'll see at least the Hay House books. There's another publisher, Hierophant, H-E-I-R-O-P-H-A-N-T. Uh, or you can go to Amazon UK. You know, they'll have them there. But yeah, UK, and also it's 
some of the stuff's been translated in other languages. I, I can't keep track of that. I've got them out in the cupboard, but uh, there are some uh, Animal Spirit Guides was published in French. I know that. My first deck was Earth Crystal. Grid Keeper says my first deck was Earth Magic, gift from my sister. Hey, yes. All right. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, while we wait for more questions, I just, I love what you said about how for everyone, whether you write fiction stories or nonfiction or whether you publish traditionally self-published or maybe you don't publish at all and it's just kept in your own teachings for yourself i love what you said about just writing just write and consider it art and don't have this perfectionist or self-limiting beliefs or fear hold you back and just just write i know a lot of people are always like how do i write a book or where do i get started and i love how you talked about it's just a creative process and it's built on this aspect of art and that may be intimidating for some, but I liked your prompt is like, okay, I'm here <laughs> to just do it, but then just let it flow however it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can do it. You know, it, it, it has its challenges, you know, any art, you know, if you want to paint, paint, if you want to sculpt, sculpt, you know, do it. Don't. And as my friend Alan said, you know, go for the B, you know, yeah. and then you might look at it and go, wow, well, I'll give it an A. You know, but it's not, that's not the goal, you know, the goal is just right. And, and the other thing is you trust that you'll be edited. <laughs> trust it. You're going to be edited. You know, if you got somebody on the side that can edit the book and give you suggestions. Uh, the book Earth Magic, I, it was a very tumultuous period in my life. And so I turned the manuscript in and, oh, God, I got like five pages of uh, edits you know, to go through, rearrange this and this and that. And I think it, thank God for a, yeah. Thank God for a good editor. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to be off camera just a little bit here. Okay. Well, we've talked a lot about cards and earth magic cards. So maybe we pull a card for the last couple minutes before Steven needs to go, unless someone has a question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, on uh, my Facebook page too, I did a, Oracle card reading for the solstice. Uh, I think it was just yesterday. So you can go there uh, and check out the reading there too. That has some, I say, good advice for the uh, this transition that we're going through. Summer's here, at least in the northern hemisphere. Somebody reminded me in the southern, it's the other way around. Winter solstice. <laughs> True. Um, so this is the card that jumped out in the Earth Magic deck, the Iceberg card. So. For anyone here, feel free to pop in what this iceberg card is um, meaning to you in regards to this discussion, whether it's about writing or ancestors or both. Um, and Marilyn, we'll get to your question in just a minute. So let's, um, the iceberg card. Stephen, does anything jump out on you with this card? Well, it's, it's along the lines of what we've been talking about here that... Um, the key word, and this is how the Earth Magic cards are constructed. There's a key word, and then there's an extended reading in the guidebook, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, you can go to the iceberg there, but I suggest, you know, contemplate the card first, you know, whenever you work with any Oracle cards, not just these. So submerge, think about, not think about, but contemplate. You know, it's a little, it involves thinking, too, but contemplate. What does that mean, submerge? And so the meaning that comes up for me about this is those hidden talents that we've kept um, submerged due to earlier conditioning, childhood, adolescence, etc. And it ain't just parents or family, it's peers. You know, how many of you have ever felt um, upset or you've been teased or anything like that, you know, by people your own age? So the task for you is Again, nine tenths of the iceberg is underwater. Underwater means subconscious. That's one of the symbologies of water, especially bodies of water like the ocean. That it's the subconscious, that area that we, um, that, that there's, that's stored there. You know, it's there and it's available. The subconscious mind is a conduit for spirit as well that then reaches the usual self so that it can be put into manifestation in the physical realm. 
So you can see some of it. You can get hints at it. You don't want to take a big, uh, gigantic ocean liner near it. What you want to do is respect that it is submerged, but do what you can to bring that forth. You know, meditation, contemplation, things we've been talking about, shamanic journey, and those of you who are on that path, that's a possibility. Sometimes talking to someone else, like what the conversation we've been having here, um, Marina, helps, helps draw out that which is like just ready to, ready to surface, so to speak. So uh, it's encouragement to pay attention to that which is in the subconscious. That's a simple way to put it. I love that. And we have tons of comments. So um, stuck, Marilyn says stuck, crystal grid keeper. I feel the iceberg card can represent stagnation or comfort, or we become frozen and traumatized and emotional from past events. Good. Um, I, like I get, Brooke says, I get that we barely scratch the surface to our creative potential and to not be afraid to take deep breaths and a deep dive. Oh yeah. Amen. Marilyn, yes, frozen trauma. I'm Sphere. When will Earth Magic come to Turkey? <laughs> Currently on one book and has been published in Turkey. Uh, and I have read that book, thanks to the author. Yeah, so. I don't know. You can write, um, you could write Hay House US with that question. They have a department there, and I'm not sure how to direct you to it. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you can write to them and say, you know, is it published in, in Turkey? I know there's one book and it, it might be, I don't, I, you know, I don't remember. Like I said, I've got a few different um, uh, samples of those books and cards, et cetera, that were published in some different countries, different languages. So check with US, uh, Hay House US. And I think that's a good segue into Marilyn's previous question about what exactly is self-publishing. So Stephen, I know you, through the Hay House, that's uh, traditional publishing. And I know you've also done a little bit of self-publishing as well, right? Correct. Um, I have some publications that were done in Australia by uh, <laughs> some friends of mine, a friend, Scott Alexander King, has a publishing company called Animal Dreaming. And uh, he works with spirit animals quite a bit as well. And um, I did the Shaman's Path cards you mentioned, you know, they were published there. I've got a small book of, of stories that, uh, about spirit animals. Uh, spirit Animals as Teachers, Guides, and Healers that was published in by Animal Dreaming. Uh, the problem is getting it across the ocean. Uh, sometimes there's delays, etc. But they're available, and I think even Amazon has some. Um, so he calls his company Assisted Self-Publishing. Sacred Stories, uh, that's another one to look up that is assisted self-publishing. On Amazon, they have a, a, a branch. Amazon's amazing. They have a branch called KDP, which is the where they print your book, <coughs> your choice, but they can print it electronically like an ebook and or uh, print it uh, as a copy, as a, a handheld copy. Uh, the first book, I went that route because I didn't, I didn't really want to deal with the publisher. It's just I wanted to get this book out, uh, Adult Children of Abusive Parents, as a 25th year anniversary. And uh, it's one of the first books on childhood trauma, you know, I must say, with a little bit of pride. Um, it, it, it goes into it in a way that I think is easy to follow. There's exercises in it. I'm not pitching the book. I'm just saying it was it was <laughs> through Amazon. And there so um, I had the rights to it, and et cetera, and uh, very happy with that. You, you, uh, they publish it at a very inexpensive price, and then you get copies at that price, and then you sell it retail. So that's, that's what I mean by uh, self-publishing. Assisted self-publishing might be an even better term. You don't get as much assistance from Amazon, the KDP branch, as you would, let's say, Sacred Stories, <clears throat> Uh, they really admire this woman who's built this business uh, over over the last few years, Ariel. So that's what self-publishing is. Yeah, and I went through the self-published, not assisted. I just went through self-published route. And so um, there's a couple ways, and I'm actually wide. It's called being wide. So you can publish through... Uh, KDP through Amazon, like Kindle 
direct printing or I can't remember what KDP is, but that's through Amazon, like Stephen was talking about. And you can distribute through KDP. So through KDP, you can have your eBooks and your print books, like Stephen was saying, and you can distribute through KDP. And that goes on Amazon and all the Amazon storefronts. Amazon also has an extended distribution option, which is a little bit recent. I don't use that because they go through, which is another distribution that you can use, is Ingram Spark. So Ingram Spark, and that's actually where this hardcover of my book came from, um, is through Ingram Spark. And Ingram Spark is a wide distribution, another wide distribution for books. And I use them for my hardbacks and my paperbacks. And then for wide distribution. And when I mean wide, I mean worldwide. So when you go through KDP, you can go exclusive and just have it on only Amazon storefronts. Or you can go wide, which was my intention to the beginning to get my stories and my books out to as many people around the world as possible. And so by going wide through Ingram, through Ingram Spark through paperback or hardback or by ebooks, there's tons of distribution. So you can go directly to, sorry, this is going, and then we'll stop, Stephen. So then um, this is going over some of your heads and you can feel free to ask me about this or pop them in the comments. But essentially, um, you can go through, sorry, I love your auras, MC Solaris, you're purple and Stephen is white. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so anyways, you can go through wide distribution, you can Google it and there's other, like you can go direct to Barnes and Nobles and you can go direct to Kobo if you're in Canada and a bunch of other storefronts. Um, so anyways, you can ask me about that if you have any questions, but essentially self-publishing is like DIY. So like when you go through traditional, you have like a, um, an agent and editor and all the things through the traditional, but when you go self-published, you can kind of consult and like reach out and make relationships and do it yourself. Okay, so. Uh, I have a, I just realized the time. I have a client, so I'm gonna have to depart. Yeah. Here. And, uh, and I wanna thank you all, and thank you especially, Marina. Keep up the good work, dear, I love you. <laughs> so I take... love you, Steven, thank you so much. Okay, bye everyone, bye Steven. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>